again and praise the Lord to everyone. And I want to thank God for His grace that has preserved us. It's so exciting to see all of you this morning, so this evening. So it's a blessing to have all of you connected this evening to to be a part of our immense uh, week celebration. Thank you for taking the time out to be a part of this meeting. We are grateful to God for your life. Few few guidelines. Um, number one, everybody, please make sure that uh, your camera is muted. That will be very much appreciated. Make sure that your camera um, is muted so that you know we don't get any um, external um, distractions. And number two, I we also want to appeal that we limit movement as possible as we can, you know, to 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 avoid distractions as well. And then. Um, Number three, uh, like you all know, we try to show our face as possible as we can. Okay, so uh, if you are with us and then you want to show your face, this is, in, especially in this time of um, um, COVID-19, where we've been separated for a very long time, this is the only way by which we connect to each other. So we love to see your faces. I mean, for some of you, we see your faces once a week through this Zoom platform. So unless it is very not convenient for you, uh, but if it is, we'll humbly ask that you show your face. Amen. And number four, we also want to, I also want to know that um, a reason of our, our guest speaker, we have um, others that are outside of KPM you know, with us here tonight. Uh, and we are, we, I want to take this opportunity to welcome everybody that is, you know, calling in outside of the KPM family. We are a big family. KPM is a very um, family-oriented we are people called of God, and um, we believe in um, challenging our generation for a fulfilled life. And so we are glad to have you be a part of our tonight's Men's Week celebration. And so wherever you are calling in from, um, I know that our people, I, I think uh, the crowd will do a lot, of, a lot of that, but I know that our people who are calling in from various places, different parts of the world, uh, you know, joining us tonight. And so... Um, we just want to welcome all of you, and we pray that you will enjoy your time with us tonight. Good night, Amen. And so tonight, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for us to um, um, to hear the the word of God. And tonight, like I said, KPM as a church, we are we are family oriented. We want to make sure that uh, we raise strong families, you know, and strong men who, who who knows their responsibility in this generation. And so we are speaking on the team. Um, the role of of a man in this you know modern day generation, the role of a man in this uh, uh, in today's generation, um, what men are supposed to do. Uh, I mean, as husbands, as fathers, in, in our various homes, you know, um, during the ancient time, the, the, there were a lot of things that you know happened. We are in in a different world altogether. So how do we navigate our way through? And um, with this topic, after um, um, serious prayer and deliberation, we find it very necessary and we deem it appropriate to invite you know, nobody else but our very own um, brother, friend, uncle, um, some call him pastor, um, um, I call him, uh, some call him elder, uh, I personally call him uncle, you know, because um, he's been a personal Uncle to me and Kiki, and she's been an amazing blessing. I mean, I mean to us for all these years, and I mean, anytime we call on him, he's ever there to respond and to be a blessing. Tonight, and we are so privileged and blessed to have him with us. Um, he's um, Elder Richard Crab, married to Mama Didian Crab, they've been married for many, many years, and they are such an amazing marriage counselors, and they've been a blessing to nations. I mean, when I say nations, nations, I know they have a podcast program they do, and they have over 30,000 people uh, following them. You know, um, there was a little miscommunication, but I hope that um, there's nothing new for these people also to hear us tonight. And so, ladies and gentlemen, it's my joy, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our uncle all the way from Virginia, our elder from Virginia, our pastor, uh, the very one and only Uncle Richard uh, Crab to, to, to take us through this session. So let's receive him wherever you are with a clap of hands. Thank you very much. Uncle, the hand over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Prophet Prince and 
all my friends at um, Kingdom Praise Ministries, good evening to you. And I also have to say good morning because um, through the good auspices of Be Inspired Podcast Network, we have people listening to us literally from all over the world. And um, Dr. Jacobs Abbe, Sami Jacobs Abbe and his team from Be Inspired Podcast uh, Network, the radio station also uh, taking us via internet all around the world. And I'm sure you will have some questions also coming in so you can have a feel. So um, your, your ministry is Kingdom Praise, so the kingdom is coming to you now. And it's a joy to be with you. And um, when Prophet uh, spoke with me about it, I told him on the spot, even before I answered, my wife answered. And um, because we we have been praying about um, this particular topic and also for a platform uh, from which we could speak uh, to men primarily, but to, to help the, the uh, people understand the situation that men find themselves in today and the whole idea of how one can be a man in the world today, not just here in the U.S. So the topic is appropriate. Um, this is uh, Father's Day week, if, you, if, you, if I may put it that way, Sunday being Father's Day. So this is very appropriate. You know, brothers and sisters, in this world, today's world, it's not good to be a man. Here in the U.S., recent events have shown it can be dangerous to be a man. But more so, the culture, the media, and the entertainment industry often attack the core of what it means to be a man. But that's on one side. What is even worse is that as men, we are buying into these lies and allowing the culture, the media, and the entertainment industry to define who we should be and who we are. But let me take you back a few years. And researching for this, I came across this, which, is very, which was remarkable. In 2015, Professor Michael Kimmel, who's a leading scholar on masculinity and director of the Center for the Study of Men and Masculinities, director of the Center for the Study of Men and Masculinities, yes, it's at the University of uh, Stony Brook in Long Island, New York. His program explores what it means to be a male in today's world. And here's how he starts his classes. So come along with me to his classroom. He asks his uh, students, first day of class, let's say it was said at your funeral, he was a good man. What does that mean to you? Here are some answers people give. You can be thinking of your own answers. If people, when you hear the phrase, good man, what comes to mind? Here's what some people said. Caring, a male student in the front said. Putting others' needs before you, another one said. Honest, a third one said. Then he paused and said to the students again, now tell me what it means to be a real man. Would your answers be the same? And this is where they began to differ. Take charge. Be authoritative. Take risks. That came from a woman. It means suppressing any kind of weakness. Another offered. Here's somebody from Turkey, what he said. I think for me, being a real man meant talk like a man. Walk like a man. Never cry. Does it sound familiar? I heard some of that growing up. You can't say Berman soon. You have to be tough. Be bold. Take it like a man. Receive it in your chest. So you see, when we think good man, we're thinking of what others might call softer things. Caring, being kind, helping people, mentoring right? 
But then when we say, what's a real man? We're thinking of all this tough guy image. You see why we get confused? And we are still confused. Because when we think in terms of coming into the home, the home setting, with these ideas, I'm sure any of you, know, you listening who's married has realized tough guy doesn't work at home to a large extent. And so this this is an exercise that Professor Kimmel gives. And I think it's worth us also examining it, not tonight, but in your own small groups. He asks, you know, first of all, what does it mean to be a good man? And here are questions. What qualities do the men you respect and admire have? Then what values and morals do they live by? What kinds of things do they say and do? That's for good man. And then also three questions also to go with real man. What do people mean when they say be a man or man up? What qualities are quote unquote real men assumed to have? And third one, how are real men expected to speak and act? And how are they not supposed to behave? That might make a good discussion in your own small groups and with your friends, especially over this weekend, Father's Day weekend. But coming to our topic, the role of a man in the home today, what does society see as the role of the man in the home? The man in the home can be a young man who's finished college or above 18, we say he's, he's an adult, he's a man now, um, 18 up, married, unmarried or single. Then you can have married people. And then you have married people who are fathers. So you have father, husband, and then man. Each of them, three in one role of a man. So when we say, what does the society, the culture around us see, you know, about the man in the home, very quickly some of you might say, oh, he's to be the head. We hear that very often in our work, Viviana and myself. He's the head of the family. But you and I also know there's very little that has been written or even said about what that involves. We, we, we know you, you, you're told you're to be the head, but how are you to be the head? What's the ideal man like in the home? The ideal husband, the ideal father, we don't know. And so we tend to follow the dictates of our upbringing some learned behavior, or the lifestyle of the culture in which we live and work. One of the things to remember is that every person is a product of three major influences. The family in which you are born, the environment in which you grow up, and then the culture in which you live and work. So let's take the environment in which you are born. For many of us who are 40 years and above, we grew up at a time when our fathers were largely absent. If you grew up in Africa and the Middle East, very likely you came from a polygamous family. And so perhaps your father was not even in the house at home. That was also the period in the 80s when there was a lot of migration to the US, to Europe, from Africa and the Middle East, people seeking greener pasture. A difficult time for Africa and the Middle East, for example, even in Asia with coups and many upheavals, wars. And so the family was largely fragmented, 40 years and up. That's what we had, the environment in which we were born. The families into which we were born, fragmented. The environment in which you grew up, recovering from war. 
going to school, not having the best of everything, making do with what you had. And coupled with that, father wasn't there. Your reference point likely was your mom or maybe another relative who may have played occasionally father figure. Now let me throw in also something that our parents even lost. With the advent of missionary work in many countries, a very significant part of growing up as a boy into manhood was lost, puberty rights. Some came to view it as evil, some pagan, and godly. But in the large, these were rites of passage. You became, you know, a teen. You began to go with the men as a boy. The girls began to go with the women. They were taught about menstruation, getting pregnant, looking after babies, cooking, looking after your home. The men were taught how to hunt, farm, how to be a man. We lost all that. In the church, it was replaced with confirmation classes. Now, for all of you who have taken a confirmation class before, tell me, during our discussion time, if any of you had a session telling you how to be a man or a woman. So let's focus on the men. Zero. I don't think there, was a, there will be any. And so you see, what replaced what we had before in many cultures did not cater for a very significant aspect. That rite of passage from boyhood to manhood. So we lost that mentorship, that coaching, and the church has not filled that void. The culture has tried to So, how does the average young man want to dress today? Like a celebrity. So I want to dress, oh yeah, I must buy PDD's uh, line. Oh, you know, LeBron is dressing this way. Oh yeah, Jordan, my time was Jordan time. So, Air Jordan became it. Do you see the models we had growing up? They weren't fathers that we could follow. So you see the vacuum we now have, trying to play the role or a role we haven't been prepared for. Churches don't give sermons on how to be a man, how to be a leader in your home, how to be a father. The home environment is not giving up. And so we're left to the culture. Let's go to the culture. What do you see on TV today? The men portrayed in TV, the father figure, let's go to the home. Apart from Cosby in the 80s and the 90s, the Cosby show which portrayed a black Afro, African-American family that was wholesome, so to speak, and all that seems to have been thrown away with the troubles that Cosby himself got into. But that was the show. I didn't live in the U.S. then, I used to visit, but... I usually stayed with friends who were Caucasian in Chicago when I visited there, and they would not miss the Cosby show because of the values it presented about family life, not only for an African-American family, but because there was such a lack of seeing that in the general culture. So that went away. What do we have today? Most of the men cast on TV today are unintelligent, they're not smart, they bumble, they're always making mistakes, and guess who's the hero? The wife, the mom. So how will your kids and my kids respect you and me when all the role models they're seeing on TV, because that's all that we have left. Church isn't teaching, home isn't teaching, so we only have the culture. Where do we go for the culture? It's TV. 
So all we're getting from there is that men are not smart, they're dumb, women save the day, kids can walk all over that dad. He's not he can't even discipline his kids. And so what are we left with? Nothing that we want to build our lives on. As somebody said, do you see the trouble we're in? We haven't had good role models growing up. And even now, the culture in which we live and work isn't helping either. And it's not only in the US. Many different countries, we could tell the same story. Against all that, there's still something else happening. The gap is closing in gender equality. What do I mean? Today, we're more gender equal than we've ever been. Not yet. Women are still being paid less in many places. But women are outpacing men in many ways. Some of you will remember the slogan, the girl child, 30 plus years ago. The girl child is now the woman of today who was helped to get through school, of course, to remedy problem, you know, a huge gap that existed because most girls weren't going to school. But with all the focus on that, I remember more than 20 years ago, a colleague counselor, a woman teaching in Achimota School, one of Ghana's top schools, said she was having a problem with the boys in her class. More than 20 years ago, she said, it had got to the point where when she asked the question in class, no boy wanted to answer. They were afraid of making a mistake. That's very different from my time, 40 years ago. It was the boys who answered. 20 years after that, it was the girls who were answering and the boys were hiding when she asked the question. And she made a comment to us. The group of counselors that were meeting said, if we don't take care, a time will come when boys will lose the edge to lead as men. We're seeing it today. What's happening? The woman oh, in, in universities today, here in the U.S., it's close to 60, 60 percent of graduates are women, 40% men. You see the disparity? So fast forward five years when they're working and they want to get married, where are the men? Where are the women? Is it happening in your church? We're seeing it around. Not just here in the US, it's happening in different countries too. As more and more women are going to school and and it's not just school. What's happening is they're rising in their offices. They're making more money. And so they're becoming more assertive, more confident. It's a good thing. It's not bad. I have only daughters, so I'm happy. But added to that, or if you, if you square that against the, the boys and men not having any mentorship, any guidance, largely being left on their own, you can understand what's happening now, not what's going to happen. We're meeting it in our ministry. Because the woman is also bringing in money. And in more and more instances, she's bringing in more money than her husband. So the role that was reserved for fathers as breadwinners, and so de facto leaders and having the stronger voice in decision making, a lot of that is being eroded now. We're having women asking questions, well, why don't I have a voice? Why don't I have a say in how the money for the family is used? After all, I'm bringing in more than him. Why should he be the one who decides? This is the reality. So what we knew as the traditional role of the man is the one who decides, 
The man has the last word. The man is the alpha male. The man is... No. The times, they are changing. And our roles, they have to change. No, the man doesn't have to play the part that my mom used to play, the relatively passive role. Although when you come to think of it, our moms were not that passive. But when you think of it, it means what we have thought about. And then you get married and you're being told you have to be head of your home. And you don't know what head of your home means. And the woman has come from a home where her mom had no say because her mom, her dad, had the money and therefore the power. But your wife now is the one who's bringing in more money. Guess what she's going to say? I also have to decide now. And so now we have conflict. But there is hope. Lots of hope. Because we're finding that Young men today are also grappling with the reality that being macho, being the alpha male figure, and even dictatorial at home doesn't work today. And it leads to deterioration of the marriage relationship. In fact, even before marriage, if you just want to be macho in your relationships, it might be more difficult for you to get married today. This is not grandpa's or daddy's world. Today, surveys are finding that young men are using words like nurturing. Sounds very feminine, right? They're using words like caring for my family. I want to be a great dad. See, my father, I, I played, U.S. doesn't play hockey. We played field hockey. It was a man's game, oh, you know, growing up in Ghana. And my goal was to play for my school's hockey team. And I made it. My dad never came to any of my games. Can you imagine your son making his high school team in any sport and you as a dad not going today? See how the times have changed? In those days, it wasn't a big deal. I was with the guys. We won a game, we celebrated. I never once thought, oh, my dad is not seeing me play. In fact, I was happy to tell him. I, we played, we beat the school, and I scored a goal. And he'll say, good. That was all. But today, you have to be, not just be there, you have to drive your child to the practice. You even have to go watch their practice. The times are changing. In fact, the times have changed. And so, when you think in terms of what a man is to be today, we can't live in our parents' world. Let me also add quickly that our parents' world is not today's world. Years ago, one of our daughters, we were talking about something. She was talking about something with her mom, and, and then she told her mom, Mom, these are the 90s. You know, different world. It's not your world. You know? Today, guys are talking about wanting to balance work and family. You're, you know, companies are even talking about work-life balance. It used to be that men didn't go to PTA meetings. Men didn't go to parent-teacher conferences. Now, we're going. I have been to some. In fact, it's a given. And I realize even in my workplace, it's one of the few things when you say you're, you're asking time for, people don't grumble. I have to go to my kid's school. Oh, okay. Today, it's more expected. Years ago, it was, why doesn't your wife go? Regardless of whether she was working or not. So the point is that if we are trying to live like our fathers lived, we're going to be in big trouble. It's not going to help. So what do we do? Men also expect today that 
the wives will work outside the home. And so if both of us are working outside the home, who's going to take care of our children? If you think back to moms and grandmas, grandmothers usually had some work around the house. So it was easy. We took care of them. Some of our mothers, a few of them started working in offices. Now it's the norm. He goes, she goes. What about the kids? What about things like who cleans the house? Who does laundry? Who cooks? Those rules aren't traditional cast in stone anymore because we're both living home. In fact, sometimes he goes mornings, he's back by three o'clock, four o'clock. She leaves three o'clock, she's gone. She's coming at 11. If he's going to wait for her to cook, she might not eat. Or she works nights, mornings he's home. So things that were fixed are no longer as fixed. The people who are working shifts, we visited a couple once, and it was so, we wondered, when do you people meet? Because he would come, she's gone. She comes, he's gone. That's the life. So you're having somehow to the money to have kids, so that's interesting, <laughs> you know. But then how do you look after the kids? So men are having to take on roles that their fathers didn't take on in years past. Oh, some 30 plus years ago when we had our first child, it was a no-no for me to take her out as a baby when she was crying in the middle of a church service. Because I took her out so her mom would stay in church and listen to the sermon. And after church, some of the older women came to chastise me for taking my baby out. Why didn't you let, let her, her mother take her out? You shouldn't be doing things like that. And some of them also spoke strongly to her. But I'm glad to say, a couple of years ago, in the same church, I hear a baby beginning to make noise, and I see a dad take out the baby in the car seat and proudly walks out with the baby swing in, then seeing other young dads, babies on their chest, trying to keep them calm during the church service. Even in places where we would say are traditional societies, it's changing. So we need to prepare ourselves for all these things. So what can we do? There are no easy answers since we've had no father figures or very few or role models that exhibited the home life we have to go through today. The Bible simply says, the man must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. First Timothy 3 and verse 4. So let's focus on the word manage. What would it involve for us to manage our own homes? First, we have even to understand what a home involves. A home is not the apartment, it's not the house. It is what we make it to become. The people in it, the values in it, everything that makes us want to be part of that. It's not the place where we stay. It's what that place represents. Is it a haven of peace? Is it a place where we're bringing up our children to respect, to love, to care? Is it a place where we ourselves are showing the, those values, demonstrating those values to our children? Wives, for those who are married and have children? What about those who aren't? What are we learning to be able to do that? So, first thing I would like us all to remember is the role of the man in the home represents three key points. First, you have to be present. You have to be present, not absent. 
your presence must be there, must be felt. When a man takes on two jobs, to give his family a better life, give them a better residence, better neighborhood, better schools, and he's not present, he's not really helping his family. I want to say that again. Providing your family with an excellent house, car, appliances, neighborhood, schools, without being present as the man, father, husband, it's not helpful to your family. Why? Because you have to be involved. That's the second point. You have to be involved. You can't, if you don't have children, your wife didn't come to marry things. She married you. So you have to be there and available. Genesis 2.18, God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. So primary reason for marriage is companionship. Yes, people talk of, oh, we are in love and all that. But the primary reason is to keep each other company. That's why she's complaining. Even after you bring in so much mullah home, she's still not happy because she doesn't see you. She doesn't have you. And she married to have you and to spend her life with you. And now the office is the one you're spending your life with. That's why she complains, even though you can give her anything that money can buy. And so we need to make adjustments. Third thing is that we need to learn to lead, not follow. So three things. The man must be present, must be involved, not passive, and must lead, not follow. What 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 about lead? We'll come to it um, in a short while. But to effectively do this, a man needs to prepare for the role, like I've said. Key responsibilities involved in all of this is we serve, which cuts against the grain of many, many cultures. We don't wait to be served. Most cultures, the leader is served. But for the Christian leader, we serve as our Lord Jesus served. You take you want a reference, Mark chapter 10, verses 42 to 45. And probably the best example of service that Jesus showed his disciples was from John 13, verses 14 to 17, when he washed the disciples' feet. He was the boss, the chief honcho, the rabbi. But he took water in a bowl and a towel and wash their feet, each one of them, dirty, stinking feet from the desert sand. Why is this significant? Because the role of washing feet in a Jewish home was performed by the lowliest servant, not by a servant, the lowest of the servants. That was their job, and Jesus did it to show them that he could serve and to teach them how to do it. Some men will not change their baby's diapers because it's a, it's a woman's job. Really? I don't know about any female baby who's born or as they grow into woman, they get another job description, diaper changer. We make the baby, we change the diapers. That's today's world. We both carry the babies. Yes, we both learn how to feed the babies. Those are not nice things sometimes. We learn to do that too. How about shepherd? I says, yeah, I'm the shepherd, I'm the boss. To guide, to provide. Probably the best um, uh, passage talking about the Bible you can learn from it's Psalm 23. You know, look at all the different things the shepherd does. He guides, he provides so that the sheep don't want. You know, he, he leads them, he protects them. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Will you stay when there is danger? 
Will you stay when there's tension in the home or you will walk? You want to be the right man for today in your home? You stay even when there's danger. When things are tough, you don't walk. Real men, real Christian men stay and work and shepherd. The shepherd also provides for his family. You work hard. 1 Timothy 5.8, he who doesn't provide for his relatives. Ooh, you like that. But he goes on, especially for his own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So today's man takes care of his home first, not of his relatives first. Yes, you're working hard in America, you're working hard in Europe, but you take care of your own home first, not your relatives first. And then how about for those who are not married yet? This is very important. Second Thessalonians 3 verse 10 says, He who will not work must not eat. You didn't know that was in the Bible? It's right there. And I know there are some ladies on the line or on, you know, <laughs> on the program. Sometimes you ladies also don't help those young men because you provide food for them. And you know what happens? They follow the food and they think they're in love with you. They're actually in love with your food. That's why when you marry them and the food is not flowing because you expect them to bring the moolah for the food, then there's trouble. So beware of letting somebody follow your food and come marry you. Bible says, if he will not work, he must not eat. Let him work. That's why way back in Genesis, one of the first things God did, he gave the man his own accommodation. Next thing, he gave him a job. Even before he gave him a wife. Then how about the steward? How about the steward? How about the steward? We, we need to learn a manager is one who takes care of the resources he is given. And I'm talking to men, that's why I'm using he, you know, as a pronoun. But to be a steward, you need to be able to take stock of what I have. Okay, here's my wife, what I have gifts and abilities. Okay, child number one, child number two. Wow, what am I going to do? Many of us are going through life without any plan. Plan for yourself. Plan for your children. Plan for your wife also. Plan for the family. So what are you managing? You're not managing anything. It's work, make money, spend money. It's not management. That's existence. And perhaps that's why sometimes... Your wife gets frustrated if you're married. And if you're not married, maybe that's why the women come and they're wondering, I don't know, I can't be with this guy. Because they don't see that you have any plans for your own life. And who wants to follow someone who has no plan? The leader is going somewhere, and so we'll get a follower. We'll get somebody to accompany him. So think in terms of making a plan for yourself. How would you want to be five years from now? Ten years from now? And then, when somebody comes into your life, you can sell that vision to them. Share that vision with them. This is what I'm planning to be in five years to, to come. Now you have somebody who's with you on that vision. Not, I'm waiting on God. Till when? You must know where you're going to have others want to come along with you. So maybe that's why you've been praying hard for a wife. And maybe they've come and they've disappeared. Not as wives, but they see he's not going anywhere. So here are some more thoughts from the Bible for specific actions. Then we'll open for questions. First of all, a few things that are key to our world today. Your faith, 
And since, you know, there are many uh, people who are Christians on this, you know, the lead, one of the key responsibilities that the Bible lists for a man in the home is to be the spiritual leader. Genesis 2, 16 and 17, God gave Adam the command not to eat of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Eve was not there. It's very funny. Many times we ask the question of people, where was Adam when the devil was tempting Eve, his wife? So maybe he was working in the garden or maybe he was asleep. Just read Genesis 3 verse 6. He was right there with her. Why didn't he talk? Because God gave him the command. We wouldn't have been working so hard today if he had just corrected it. But what is the majority gender in churches today? What's the majority gender? It's women. So where are the men who are going to provide the spiritual leadership? Oh, he's working. He's at his second job. They scheduled him for Sunday. Every Sunday, because Sunday pays more. Every holiday, because it's double. So let's think of what we're going to do to balance this out. And brothers, you cannot give that which you don't have. Your wife is not in love with the pastor. Your, your, your wife is hungering after God. is thirsting after God. And you're not there to help her. That's why she keeps going. Maybe if you prayed with her at home, she wouldn't always want to leave you and go to the prayer meeting or go talk to somebody else to pray with her. Just praying with her, for her, about her. The one you said you loved so much, you wanted to spend the rest of your life with. If I sound hard, don't worry. It's hard on me too because I have to live up to this and it's not easy. So how about, so we need to learn about God. We need to learn from God. And when in Ephesians it talks of the man leading his wife, it says, as Christ leads the church. So we draw our leadership, spiritual leadership from Jesus. And if we're not learning about him, about how he leads, and about how he would want us to lead, how will we do it? If we don't even know the word of God, how are we going to teach our home? And we're going to leave it for the church? No. Read Deuteronomy 6, 5 to 9. It says we should teach our children when we wake up, when we lie down, when we're sitting down, when we're walking along the way, we add when we're driving along the way. That's when we're supposed to do it. That's why somebody like Joshua would say, ask for me and my house, we will serve the Lord because he had decided what to do. And we know Joshua's history. But if we are not walking with the Lord, there's no way we can get our children to do so well. That's why the women are picking up the slack. We're in this ministry with families. Every so often you hear a woman saying, I'm tired. I'm tired. I wish my husband would do this. And they're right, because it's the man's role to lead his family spiritually. And women, some of you are listening. Don't be too quick to take over his role. That's why you get frustrated, because it is yours. Encourage him to do so. Then what else can we do as men? One of the things in the home we should do is to love our wives and to demonstrate that love so that our children also catch it. Many of us grew up in homes where we did not see our parents show affection to each other. I've heard people say, I was never hugged. So why do my children expect that I'll hug them? Well, they expect you to hug them because they're not you. And they're living in a different era. And if they expect that you hug them, brothers, 
we have to hug them. I learned how to do it. You can do so too. It's not easy, but that's what makes the difference between us and the generation before us. And one of the most important things we can do for our families is to so love our wives that our marriage will be secure. Because children draw their security from their parents' relationship. To the extent, those of you who are teachers might know this, that when kids start acting up in school these days, one of the questions the counselors ask them is, what is life like at home? One of the first questions school counselors ask these days, what is life like at home? Because that is beginning to show in what happens at school also. Then what about, and oh, I need to say this because I love, I love it. I, I read it from uh, someone, Steve Sable, and he says, when you truly care for your wife or your woman, he says, so it's, if you're not married and you're in the, on the way, this is helpful too. When you truly care for your woman, you will find the courage to protect her heart and fight for her, not against her. I want to say it again. When you truly care for your woman, you will find the courage to protect her heart and fight for her, not against her. So we love our wives as Christ loved. This is not easy. And we also give more compliments. Yes, maybe you didn't hear your dad do it. Your wife says, I would love to hear compliments. Just give her a compliment. How much you have to pay to give a compliment? Zero. But it reaps rewards are plenty. And two more points. How about children? I've talked a little bit about their coming up, but we need to be involved in every aspect of their lives, starting from the home. And education starts from the home, not from the school. Before they enter that preschool or that crash, we need to give them basics. Respect, love, care, all of that. The home is like, it's the best place for us to teach those things. You send your child to school, what values does the teacher have? They can teach them math. What values will they also add to the math? You don't know. But you can teach your child those values at home. So that regardless of what they meet in school, they've got the right foundation. Or how about Sunday school? Some people send their children to church, so the church will teach them. Well, how about the Sunday school teacher? Do they share your values also? And do they have the time to take for your child alone? We are the ones who are tasked with that. God gives us the children, not other people. So we need to ask ourselves, what values do we have that we want to pass on to our children? And how are we doing this? And it starts from the home. Some men have been antsy because of the lockdown and are feeling liberated now. We did um, a program on what the lo whether the lockdown is wearing you down. You, you can log on to be inspired um, podcast network into the archives and listen to it. But the majority of men, especially, couldn't stay in their homes. Well, guess what? We found, we were getting phone calls from both husbands and wives. I can't stand my husband. Oh, I'm just waiting to leave the house. Because we've become used to living our lives outside our homes. Just think of the time you spend outside your home on a day, in a day. Eight hours at work, plus your commute, 
plus other things you'll do. How much time do we really spend at home? Productive time, that is. And you realize it isn't much. So we have to make the most of that time. And we need to balance our work as well as our leisure time. You know, if you take a typical 24-hour day, you sleep eight hours, you have 16 hours, you have eight hours to go to work, but your commute might be another two hours, you got six hours left, you're going to eat, you're going to watch CNN or some, you know, some sport or sports. Yeah, now they're going to come back. We've been watching reruns, some of us who love sports. But then how much time is left for the rest of the family? That includes your children, your wife, and one more person, yourself. Because we have to work on ourselves also. The Bible says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. If we believe our treasure is in the home, our hearts will be there also. But if you believe your treasure is your paycheck, your heart will be in the office. Make your choice, even tonight. And the key to being a successful husband, successful Christian husband, is living a balanced Christian life and having the right focus. It starts with a change of mindset. We can't live, we can't continue the way we've been. We need to make some changes. We need to make some improvements. Let me offer this. You want priorities? God first. Your family second. And within this, your wife first. Yes. Not the kids first. Your wife was there before they came. She'll be there after the kids go. And then, your vocation, your work, and ministry come next. Some of us use the ministry to bully our wives. You're doing the work of God. Your first ministry is in your home, not in the church. Know why? This is what God's Word says. That if a man cannot manage his own home well, he has no business managing the household of God. So God gives us our test in our homes, and then after that, he allows us to do work in his home. So what will your priorities be, and how will you go about this? Thank you for listening. When we open up for questions, I'll be glad to listen to your comments also. God bless you. Okay. So we all clap our hands and show some um, appreciation here. Wow. Wow. That is very, very deep, very informative, very educative. And I believe that by now, some mindset are beginning to shift and um, there's a shaping going on somewhere. And I believe that not just, you know, I believe that our men are beginning to get some perspectives right and beginning to understand that, understand some basic things that we need to understand as Christian men. Um, that is awesome. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Crab. Thank you very much, Pastor Crab. Thank you very much, Uncle Crab, for this awesome time. I believe that um, we have questions. Um, so we're going to open this moment up for questions. And so feel free to um, ask any question. You can go to the chat uh, uh, section and type in your question if you, if you so wish. Um, if not, you can also just go to the section, you know, and then do that hand thing, you know, the emoji thing, and just indicate it. And then we'll, we'll, I'll be able to see you and then I will also um, call you. If not, you can also wave, you know, and then we'll be able to um, also recognize you and give you the opportunity for, for your questions. For those of you that have your cameras blocked and those of you calling um, on the uh, phone lines and all of that, um, just, I don't know how we're going to do that, 
But if you can go to the uh, chat section, just type in your question and we'll be more than glad to respond to you. So um, for the next, I think, 20 minutes, we're going to open it up for questions. So anybody have any question? I mean, both for men and women. Well, I see, I see, I see, um, um, I see first lady's hands up, Kiki's hand is up. Okay, so um, can you go ahead? And then again, um, I'm trying to get something from Dr. Mr. Abe. Uh, how do we get those that are calling in uh, from the phone um, lines? How do we get them to ask their questions if they have to? So maybe Abe can put something on the chat, on the chat section for me to, to know that. But let's receive, uh, let's allow, um, Lady Kiki to ask her question, so go ahead. Just, just before she does, uh, Dr. Abel says he sent uh, several questions to Minister Sly, so he might he might be able to feed some of them I, in. I have, yeah. I have some questions from some of his um, audience and, and uh, clients from his, his network. So, Excellent. Okay. So after, okay. after, after Ms. Kiki, yeah, thank you. Thank you. After first, okay, so after Kiki, then uh, Mr. Sylvester can ask those questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, Uncle Richard. Hello. <laughs> Hi. I thought this was a mess meeting, but you are allowed. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. Uncle Richard, I've been waiting for you for a whole week. <laughs> a whole week. <laughs> anyway, so um, my question is, as a woman uh, today who is, you know, navigating being married to a man of today, you mentioned a lot of the things that men should be doing. And I know that a lot of times our culture plays a part in that. Religion plays a part in it as to how it has allowed men to define their own sense of privilege in the home or in church, things that they should or shouldn't be doing. Um, and so I know that those things exist and I just want you to speak to how, as women, we can also navigate having ambition and wanting to be successful and also knowing how to be good wives and good mothers and CEOs without necessarily taking away from the role of a man. Because whatever the case is, the doors and the opportunities that are available to women now are bigger and better than they've ever been. And it would be a miss as a woman if we weren't stepping through some of those doors and creating paths for the women coming up after us. Okay. But how do we navigate that without turning into women who are basically cutting our men off at the knees? Because that's not also what we want to do you know, and especially not as Christian women. So what, what is that, what is that path? What is that biblical and spiritual path that we can say, okay, this is how it, this is what it looks like to be an ambitious woman who wants to do as much as she can do, who also wants a partner who appreciates that and, you know, isn't going to, like you had mentioned earlier, you know, wear her out by, you know, kind of waiting for her to do all the things in the home and then for the children and then outside as well, because yes, there is an expectation that women should be providers now and we should also be caretakers and we should also be cleaners and cooks and lovers all at a hundred percent level every day, you know, but how do we now say, okay, as women, we do want to be successful but we don't want to be successful at the expense of our marriages or our relationships or even our Christian um, discipline. But we still want that success and we still want partners who can appreciate that, applaud that, and come alongside with that. Excellent. Could make a whole session in itself, maybe even two. But, um, you know, the... The answer lies in before a woman gets married. First of all, she should know what she wants to do for herself. And just like I had said in the presentation that a man needs to have his own plan. Some people like saying vision, 
vision looks, you know. But what's the plan for your life? So a woman comes into a relationship, first of all, with her own mindset, her own plan or plan for her own life. The trouble starts when the woman is only coming into a relationship to get married and does not share that plan she has for her life. And so that feeds into the second step. In finding a life partner, a spouse, she also considers somebody with whom she can work as a partner, as a teammate. I hear Christian people that talk soulmates, so all this guy. I don't know. I'm not a, you know an expert in that, but I understand what a teammate means. Somebody who's on the same team with me. Somebody who will help me become better. Somebody who can challenge me. You see. So the woman, and she might be a high achieving, high achiever already in her own right. But because of the very things you're talking about, your wife, okay, so I have to be submissive. Submissive doesn't mean you're passive. No, not at all. One of the most submissive women I knew was actually a United Nations expert training people around the world. She owned her own factory. One of the first women industrialists in Africa, Esther Oklu of Ghana. And when she talked about her husband, wow, you think she worships this man. But in terms of, you know, prestige, outlook, and everything, she was way higher than him. But she would never know that. So who can be a teammate to you who will help you along your path and not derail you? We're finding in our ministry right now that the men, the, the men love marrying the woman who's making more money, who's an achiever. You know, because, hey, that's my wife, you know? Yeah, she's a VP of such and such. But then what do they do to her in the home? They're just bringing her down all the time. And the woman begins to think, maybe there's something wrong with me. But no. And the several times my wife and I have had to talk with women, there's nothing wrong with you. What is wrong is that your husband does not understand. But that's why I said it starts from before the marriage. And so tell your friends, the women, not to be so interested in marriage, they forget about who they want to be after marriage and who they are already coming into the marriage. The woman in the Garden of Eden walked with God into her marriage. She was a godly woman. She was an adult, not a baby, that was brought to Adam and walked with God. So the man has to expect that from her. If she's expecting the man to make her a better Christian, there's already trouble because it's iron that sharpens iron. Iron does, does not sharpen coal. One, iron doesn't sharpen wood. You see. So there's that also. And the third key point I would like to make for the women is marry somebody who respects you and whom you will respect regardless of their status. Because that's where the problem often comes. She wants to get married so much, she doesn't mind. Oh, he's okay. No, he's all right. Then they get married and she realizes Oh, this guy, I can't even discuss some of these uh, business terms with him. He doesn't understand stock market differential. I don't know. What kind of man is this? So she doesn't want to come home. So she stays longer hours. And so he begins to feel she's not respecting me. And guess what he does? He also finds ways to bring her down to his level of feeling disrespected. Both are frustrated. In terms of 
the different things, responsibilities, that's where teamwork comes in. On a team, I love soccer, so let me give that analogy, or even basketball. It's not everybody who scores the basket. There's some people who are great in assists. And sometimes even the star player makes an assist for somebody else to score because that person is in a better position. That's what real teamwork does. So it's not a matter of, oh, I'm the man, and you know where I come from, a man doesn't cook. This is not where you come from. So why are you trying to live like where you come from? <laughs> you know? So <laughs> your wife is gone. She has a board meeting. She's coming 9 p.m. You're going to wait 9 p.m. for her to come and cook? You're going to eat at 11 p.m. You know, one of my daughters makes clothes. She was quick one. We were done with the, you know, and a lady came in to try something, pick up something. While she was there, our daughter told us later on, phone call comes, husband is at home. So, are you going to make the banku? For those of who don't know, you know, first phone call. A few minutes later, have you left yet? No, it's third phone call. So when will you be home? And it's getting later and later. And the guy is waiting to eat his banku before he sleeps. Why? Because she promised. And you're still waiting? And this guy is stronger than the woman. I'm sure he could make the banku even easier. For those listening from Southern Africa, it's Saza and the Kenyans, you know, you know, all that, you know, we have so... There are things we can do together. We don't have to share responsibilities as such. We need to clean this place. You know? Why don't you? There's nothing like, I did it last week. You have to do it this week. Oh, by the way, this week I'm flying to France on business. So it's not going to be done two more weeks, three more weeks, you know? Oh, you don't do your part. No. We are a team. Who's keeping score? It's us. It's our home. Same with the kids, you know. So there's, there's more we could say about this. The men who complain, the women, make them late to church. Why don't you help to dress up the kids? She wakes up, bathes the kids, cooks your breakfast, feeds the kids. What are you doing? And all you're waiting to do is to be the big daddy who's driving his family to church. And you're already angry before you leave home because you're already late. And she's, she's affecting your spiritual life. And it's a very important part of your spiritual life to make sure your family gets to church on time. And part of that has to do with, you got three kids. She bathes them, why don't you dress them up? And while she is taking her bath, why don't you feed the kids? And by the way, Saturday night you could... Eye on her clothes for her. That's a loving husband. Look at all the time you have left. How could you be late to church? Okay, we could say more about this, but let's have other people, you know. <laughs> all right, so, and, uh, as a club, uh, I have a question from uh, one man. I don't know whether it's a man. I, I think it's a man. It's called Kiwa from Kenya. Um, who sent his question through Dr. Abe's uh, network. He okay. says, how do you balance being an empathetic, warm, and supportive boyfriend or husband without compromising your manhood? Um, I'm just, I'm, I'm just reading. Yeah, this, this is very good. Very, very good. It's, it's just by doing exactly what you said. Be empathetic if you can be, if you understand what it means. That's the other thing, you know. So one of the ways to learn how to be empathetic is to ask the woman, you know, how, how is it? <laughs> Since well, yesterday we we're talking with a couple and, and the, the woman, all she wants, when I bring something up and I'm telling my fiancé, I don't want to be fixed. I don't want him. To, I just want him to listen. Guys, we have to learn Sometimes to drop our Mr. Fix-It attitude that our fathers had. Sometimes just to listen and be able to take wifey or fiancé in our arms 
just say, I understand. I understand. Sometimes that's all we need to do, not to solve the problem. It does not compromise your manhood if you put your arms around your wife, if you hold your wife's hand in public. By the way, why is it that when we are not married, we hold hands? Then when we get married, we stop holding hands. That's another discussion. But being that doesn't reduce our manhood. See, again, what is it that we want? I want to get closer to my wife, to my fiancé, or to this lady I'm interested in. It's holding of hands. That's what makes her feel close to me. Okay, if I hold her hand, does it, does it make me less of a man? I know a guy who wouldn't hold, you know, his fiancé even after he married. He wouldn't hold his wife's purse when they were in the mall and she was going to the bathroom. Because growing up, family friend told him a man does not hold a woman's bag. No, it's not good. It's not right. You're the man. You see. Well, so what's wrong if you hold a bag? What happens? Did something happen to your hands? No. Okay. Good. Try it again. It, sounds, it, it, it feels funny. After the third time, it's not funny anymore. She feels happier. You feel good too. She loves to go out with you. So sometimes, and this is where our culture clashes. And not only the culture, but our peers also. Because when I started taking a crying baby out of the church, some of the people who frowned on me were my own peers. Why don't you let your wife do it? You are doing a woman's job. You change your babies that, oh, it's the woman who should do it. It's my child too. Women don't come with that written as part of their job description, like I said. So those are things we can do. It's when the culture clashes with what, with what we, we, we want to do or what we feel is right to do, we ought to ask ourselves, what is wrong with my doing what I feel is right? Or what I know is right? You see, we need to ask those questions because there are people who say, oh, you know, where I come from, or oh, we don't do this. Who are the we? Don't we form part of the culture? And isn't there a saying that culture is dynamic? Traditions can be static, but who made the tradition? Human beings, right? For their time. When those things were established, they were not thinking of us. So we can establish our own, especially when it relates to those closest to us. So your manhood, my manhood would not be reduced. We often have to fight with our own mind. That's why I said the mindset has to change and with our peers and sometimes with others who will see us. Look at him. He's holding the basket from the market. But it can be done. You got more? Or maybe another person? Um, yes, I have, I have more questions, but I think we have... Um... Uh, one Emmanuel, Emmanuel who also raised his hand on the chat. So if, if Emmanuel, Emmanuel is on, the, is on the Zoom, if you can unmute yourself and ask a question before I go to the yeah. Well, mine is a very simple question. This is Emmanuel Kicher calling from Ghana. Hi, Uncle Richard. Hello, uh, forever. <laughs> yeah, just to find out if this session has been recorded, Zoom, and if it has, um, just to encourage you the link to share with everyone who has been on the, on the call today. <laughs> I'll leave that to Kingdom Praise. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening in from Ghana. Thank you. Thank you. And I think um, by courtesy of uh, Dr. Abe, uh, the, the audio files have been recorded. So um, anyone who wants it can leave their email on the chat. And then um, if... When, when, when after the session, uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, Dr. Abbey can 
can can help us share to anybody who wants a file. So in case you want a file, just go to the chat and send send your email address, and then we can we can make sure you get a file afterwards. So I'll take I'll take the next question from uh, one Mr. Joseph from Liberia. He says, I think you probably answered part of his question, but he said, is there a way uh, a wife can fix a broken drawer and a husband wash the night dishes at night and yet still maintain their sense of femininity and masculinity and come together and respect each other's contribution? Excellent. See, I, I, have, I have daughters. One of my daughters is excellent when it comes to fixing things. We get something to fix. She said, Daddy, leave it. And she can fix it. And I once told her, boy, you better pray you don't marry a guy who can't do anything. But maybe that's what will happen. That's why you're fixing everything. You know? It's, it's great if it happens that way. And that's why we need to encourage each of our children to be the best they can be. Because, yes, and this is why I said the times are different from our parents' times. You know, the women engineer. If my wife is a great engineer and she can fix all things engineering, why do I have to force to do that because I'm the man? You know? So, yeah, excellent, um, George from Liberia. That's how life should be in the home. A man can do great dishes, cook even. We know couples in which the man is the better cook. But nobody else outside the home knows that he's the great cook in the home. They entertain people. He does most of the cooking. And guess what? His wife is a great host, hostess. And so their friends love coming to the home to eat. And before they go, you know how it goes. They're thanking the woman. Oh, this wonderful meal. And like a good Christian woman, what does she do? She says, oh, it's actually my husband who, who, who cooks it. Your husband, please. He doesn't know anything. This man, what can he do? But he is the great cook in the home, you know. But together, they entertain. People love their home. And they're getting on. And they respect each other. That's important. Thank you. Okay. I think before I continue, I think Priscilla had a hand up so she can ask a question and I'll, I'll read the next question I have. Yes, good evening. Um, Mr. Um, Crab, I have a question. Um, in the event that um, a woman has been leading in the home mm -hmm. due to life situations, right. what can, I know we are talking about the mental role, but what can that person do to um, condition her mind in the event that when there is a man in the home, there won't be, you know, friction right. or... Mm -hmm. I, I think it's it's because we we as as I tried to explain we have messed up the concept of leadership. Mm -hmm. The leader doesn't have to do every doesn't have to know everything doesn't have to be able to do everything. That's why I use those three words to serve, to shepherd, and to steward. You see, so he and and the, I love the word the Bible uses manage. You know. And because we also have from culture, the manager is the boss. No, manage is, you know, I've got a little this, a little that. How can I make it work? Women do great at it, right? You have uh, some onions, some tomatoes. Wow, we got, we got some more people coming for, for lunch. What can I do? And you manage, right? Yeah. So if a woman finds herself leading, i.e. being the one who's in charge, making the major decisions, etc. One of the things that needs to happen if her husband is around is to have a discussion. Well, first of all, she needs to take um, um, so, uh, to evaluate why am I in this position? Is it because I'm making more money? Is it because my husband is apathetic? Is it because he's passive and won't do it? Or is it because I bully him? Or I may have bullied him into that position. Now, for the ladies on the program, let me tell you this. See, 
that so much puts on the head of the man to be in charge. I don't know of any man who has found that his wife is doing a great job and he says, don't do it anymore. We'll take a back seat and enjoy the ride. Where the problem is, is when the complaints keep coming from the woman. You're not playing your part. So that's when we have the discussion, the talk. And you start by finding out why am I in this position? Knowing why the, no, when the wife knows why she's in that position, then you know what to talk about. If it's because the wife is earning more, well, okay, what does she expect from the man? Is it for the man to have more of a say in the decisions? Then we, that's what we talk about. How can you get more, or maybe even to get more involved, you know? Even though the check is coming in my name, I don't have to be the one who's taking the boys to the mall to buy them clothes. Why don't you go with the boys? That's boys, boys time. You know, there are things we can do in that regard. But it basically comes down to what I talked about, the respect and the teamwork aspect. How can we work as a team? And blessed is the couple whose relationship is not defined by money or status. Because the moment that begins to happen, it undermines the relationship itself. And the man is more likely to say, no, no, it's okay, just go ahead and do what you've been doing. Because guess what? He's comfortable. He doesn't have to do it. And what does what happens to the woman? She gets more frustrated because she begins to feel, I'm carrying too much. So it's talking about how can we do this together? And if, if the woman re realizes that she has ignored the man's leadership role, it helps to say, you know, I think I've been doing this thing wrong. You should be the leader. How are you going to lead? And talk about that. Have a frank discussion. You have a follow-up? Yes. Uh, yes, actually, my question, I, I don't, maybe my question wasn't clear. My question was in the event where in a single parent home, where there isn't oh, any. Single. Oh, sorry. I think. Okay. In an event okay. where mm -hmm. a single parent home where, where there isn't any men and the woman okay. has been leading for over a decade. Mm -hmm. So, in an event that someone is coming in, how, how would that look like? Meaning, what are some of the challenges? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's that's, the, that's the, princi the principles will be, will be basically the same thing, yeah. but. Because the woman would have been the single parent, has taken all the decisions, now one of the things is to begin, and again it starts in the mind, to recognize I am not the only person who will be deciding now. Even if the woman already has children, the man is coming with or without children. The decisions about my children also will involve the person coming in. So that's when you begin to discuss the teamwork. How will we do this? And look for the, some of the very specific things you've been doing, the, the woman would have been doing, need to be discussed with the man. Parent-teacher conference. Now, when it's parent-teacher, I'm not going alone. I will start going with you. So you also get acquainted. And you know what? Next month, if there's a PTA meeting, you will be going. I'm not going this time. You see, you, you need to break each other into um, the responsibilities that one person has shouldered, you know, for now. And one area to watch out for is the area of discipline. Because that's where the man's authority can be eroded very quickly. Especially if the woman already has children, you know, and the man attempts to discipline them and the woman comes in and undercuts him right in front of the children. 
doesn't, that destroys a lot about his leadership ability or even recognition of his leadership from the children. And it also shows that the woman doesn't recognize his leadership. Because you can't say, oh yeah, I'm happy for him to be my head, but not over my children. Because they're not his biological children. You know, so that's something that needs to be worked out. If there's a way the man goes about it that is not the way the woman would want, as we say, that's behind closed doors but not undercutting each other in front of the children, you know. So think of the different things you'd be doing, hospital visit, all of those things that a single parent will be doing and begin to rope the person into it. And you know, for women, you got to know this. The best time to get the man to do those things is before I do. Get him involved before you walk through that door together. Because then he will already know. He won't say, oh, I didn't know how to do all this. He would have known already. And you can also check him out. Yeah, he's all right. He can do it. Check mark, check mark. He can go through the door. Very good question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so I have, before we go on, I see some other questions in the comment, but I have one question from Mr. Fifi in Ghana. He says, how do you manage your own internal responses, such as your emotions, when your wife tells you that she's been promoted and now has a higher position or a higher pay grade than you? So how would you, how, how would you advise men to manage their internal responses or um, their emotions in such circumstances? Rejoice with those who rejoice. Then you can mourn with yourself if you mourn. <laughs> But, you know, I think, again, it has to do with how we see ourselves, you know, that the man should be the higher person, so to speak, you know. But it doesn't have to be so. If it is so, she got promoted. I should be excited. It's when she got married to me. I'm doing something right. That's why she's been promoted, you see. Let's look at it that way. I'm doing something right. I have provided the environment that is making her flourish as a person. We should be celebrating. And if we are not going ahead as we should, maybe do I need to take a course? Do I need to do something? And if she's moving ahead and you also, you can use that as encouragement rather than feeling left behind. It was just, this, what the, the way the question was asked is beginning to, let me feel, that's the kind of person, if he doesn't grow out of that, he's going to mess up his wife. Because he's going to envy her and he's going to begin doing things to belittle her and she's going to start losing her self-esteem, which will affect her work. Not only her work, but her love life with him. And he's not going to understand, but he will be the cause of it. So, you know, if, if, you, if we feel we, we have to do better, so we go higher, fine, but it's not a competition. Remember teamwork? This is not competition. I may be the one who cooks the goal but I don't score it. If my wife scores the goal by being promoted, hey, guess what? We have more money now. You know, let's look at the positives. And then we can use that to ginger ourselves also. And by the way, gentlemen, if you are praying for a promotion and it's not coming, I got one Bible verse for you. First Peter 3, 7. At the end of that verse, it says, so that your prayers will not be hindered. It says we should live considerately with our wives. The end of that verse says, so that your prayers will not be hindered. So maybe we need to check also how we're treating them. By celebrating, we might open ourselves for God's blessings too. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Cobb. I think Mr. Samoa has his hand up. Um, so if Mr. Samoa Kanta, you know, if you can mute yourself and ask your question, please. Uncle Richard, how are you? <laughs> yes, I'm doing fine. <laughs> I have a very simple question. All and right. Is, uh, how do you, as a father, pull your family along with you in uh, your mission or your 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 desire to make it as the head of the family? Okay. So, um, can can you give an example, perhaps? Um, For instance, uh, you, you, you want the family to be at point B, okay. and uh, you, you can foresee point B, uh -huh. but okay. they don't seem to understand where you are uh -huh. going. Uh -huh. so okay. you, 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 you believe that that is where you want to go as a family. All right. How do you get them back on track excellent and yeah. thanks thank you so much um this this also addresses one of the um issues i raised earlier what we didn't get growing up many of us and that is the family communicating together so i have an idea where the family should be in five years my kids are growing up, they're getting into their teens, for example. I ought to be, I'm going to use the Christian term, I ought to be pouring into them those ideas, the vision I have, so that at least they know about it. But let's say we've, we've, we failed to do that for a while. Now we, we, we have this idea, but much as we, we try and the family isn't getting it. One of the things to do is to have a family sit down. Most of us didn't get this. But to sit together and father share with them. But I'll say in practical terms, before you get the whole family down, share with your wife first. Because if you get her in your corner, Battle is more than half one. And then share with the whole family. I think sometimes we underestimate our children. You know, on, on Sunday, we'll be having on the same podcast. It won't be Zoom, but we'll, we'll get the podcast. The, the topic for Sunday will be parenting today's children. And we will look at the context in which, you know, children are growing up today. And when you contrast it with our time, how many of us sat with our parents to talk about where they're going? They just said, I am moving to Abiyokuta and we all just left. Whether you were leaving your favorite, you know, your best friends in secondary school or who cared? They didn't even ask you. Today we may think again before we just do that. You see. So, we need to create that. In our home, my wife and I can call a family meeting anytime. It's a forum, we call it. The girls can call us to a meeting too. They say, yeah, daddy and mommy, we want to discuss this. And when COVID started, they called us to a meeting. Our oldest is in Ghana. The rest are here. You know, not all of them are in Virginia. Well, guess what? They put the one in Ghana also on the phone, and our niece, they're all on the phone, and they told us, okay, you guys are high risk, because we're both over 60, you're not going out. What do you mean we're not going out? That's it. They grounded us. They could only do that because over the years we've cultivated that. We've created a communication channel, and that's one of the things I would encourage all of us to do. To create the environment in which we can talk together as a family. Communicate with each other. Uh, let me say quickly, 
last year we were in, we we spoke Viviana and I spoke in two camps um which featured teens and from each of those camps one of the messages very strongly the young people said we should share with their parents so i'm sharing with you also who are parents is that they want their parents this is the us they want their parents to talk with them not only to talk to them i repeat it the children say they want us parents to talk with them and not only to talk to them we tell them have you done your homework go and do this go and, uh, we are going here we are talking to them but we don't talk with them in other words we don't even listen to them they come with a question they ask mommy where do baby hair who has who told you that? have you done your homework you know have you read your bible they are off so we need to listen to them also and that can happen best when we create that forum it doesn't have to be formal it can be informal but we know we're discussing something important and they will know and we need to listen to their input as well because they might have a perspective we may not have considered and that's something I'll, we have found it very helpful in our home because sometimes our girls have brought things to our attention that we haven't thought of you know so for example once the the meeting was all about okay we're very worried about the two of you you seem to be just traveling traveling speaking 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 when are you taking a vacation for yourselves when are you going to rest we think you should carve out some rest for yourselves that's good cool. they were they were right it's true well guess what if we fall ill who loses they would lose more than any of the people we've been speaking to so it's important that we create that environment and that, that's what i will encourage uh, sami that's one way we need to do that share this it may not all be at one boom but you know over time you can release some of these but if you know as somebody said time is fast spent what you do you have a meeting say you know i've been thinking and that's why i said you get your wife in your corner she's backing you up speak ask for their views don't just tell them ask for their views listen to them make it a discussion not an address you know and then listen to them discuss debate and so okay oh uh, yeah you got some good points okay we'll think about it we include your wife let them know that she is with you it helps a lot a whole lot thank you so much thank you thank you uncle uncle richard um there's a couple of questions in the chat as well that i want to read uh, i think mama blessing asked one question i think it's a simple one that I know that is fast for now. It's a simple one that I see. Okay. Is there anything a man shouldn't be doing at home? Is there is there anything at all? Any one thing that a man should not be doing at home? Um so it will be you can just address that and then there's a like two more questions to on the chat. Nothing. Nothing. As simple as that. In other words, a man shouldn't be doing nothing at all. <laughs> He should always have something to do. <laughs> We men that's one of the things we love on our list doing nothing. <laughs> okay then I have a question from um uh from uh, from Cynthia from New York. She says how can I help my husband to be a better man when he doesn't listen to advice? How can I help my husband to be a better man when he doesn't listen? to advise I wish my wife were here to answer this so I'm going to answer from what I've learned from her A lot depends ladies on how you talk to him or I should say how you talk with him about it Often what the man hears is a complaint 
and the suggestion is given more as a directive. You should do this and that. You have to do this and that. Or why don't you do this, such and such? Why don't you? I don't do because I'm not doing it. You know. So it helps to ask the question or, or to present, you know, I've been thinking we need to have prayer time together as a family. And ask the leader, you know, I want to hand it over to you. You haven't told him you have to. See what I mean? And gentlemen, we have to practice listening to our wives. For those of us who are married, if you are not married, put it in your head that when you marry, you listen to your wife. You will live long. And there will be a lot of joy in your home. But some, and the way, we, we often hear people say, the way my wife talks, the way my wife talks, you know. So there must be something. And one lady told us, even when I, however nice I say it, my husband will resist. Sometimes it's cultural. Because the man feels he's doing what his wife is telling him to do. But I learned from an older Christian woman, if your wife tells you something to do as a man, and you go out and do it, or you go ahead to do it, not written on your face. He's doing what his wife told him to do. If it's good, who is congratulated? People don't even know your wife told you or she came up with the idea. So we need to practice listening to each other in that regard and not simply dismissing what comes because it's from a woman. See where the culture comes in? You know. But let's think of ourselves as partners in life together, journeying together on the same team, you know, and way to find the value in what a, a wife might be telling you. It does help a lot to do that. And remember, brothers, especially if she's a Christian, First Peter 3, 7, she too is a joint heir of the grace of Christ. In other words, she too has the Holy Spirit. Did God once speak to his prophet through a donkey? Yes, he did. Your wife oodles better than a donkey. She got the Holy Spirit too. God can speak through her to you. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle. I think uh, since we're talking on the issue of culture, there was a question from one Peter from Uganda. He okay. asked that, um, do you think that the way a person is raised can affect their behavior. And I think you answered that already. <laughs> Definitely. So, so, so we had a follow-up question that said that how can a man break away from his family culture? In other okay. words, maybe from the way he was raised mm -hmm. and, the, and how can a man break away from such? Excellent. The first step is by learning differently, by learning how to do things differently. The people who grew up seeing their fathers beat their mothers, but they don't beat their wives because they've learned that it's brutish to do that. God didn't give me a wife to beat her. He gave me a wife to love her and to make her part of me. So, yes, and that's, again, that's why I said it begins from our mindset. You know, this is how it was done by my parents, or this is what is done in our culture, but what is right to do. And sometimes culture is very wrong. And we need, especially for us as Christians, we need to confront culture if we can. If we can't go tell some elder, we won't do it. Your home is your castle. Isn't that what we say? So you treat your wife well in your home. If other men are beating their wives, leave them to do that. If they're more treating their wives or they won't do certain things at home, your home it's your home, it's your home, you know. So that's what we'll say. Learn differently and practice differently. And also 
it helps. I want to emphasize this. Listen to your wife if you're married. Listen to her. And what is it she's saying? Does it make sense? Okay. Can we try it? And then we review. Is it really working for us? It's working. Let's keep it. Others can do differently. This is what we do in our home. We keep it that way. Okay, I think there's, there's, a chat, there's a question on the chat that I'll try to paraphrase. It says, in the light of deep issues arising, I believe in a family or in marriages, what then, sh what then should the principal values one must focus on? So what then should be the principal values that we should focus on in, in the light that we have deep issues arising from, arising in the families? When you say deep issues, I don't understand, but... Yeah. I mean, I can I can give a quick recap of some of the things. You know, the man should be present, not absent. Should be involved, you know, not passive. And should lead, not wait to be asked. You see? And then the man learns to serve and not to be served. The man... Shepherds doesn't wait to be asked. And the man is also a steward because he has to learn to manage whatever he has. Whether it's money, whether it's gifts, talents, and abilities, whatever it is, this is the man's role, biblically speaking. And many cultures will support this also. But yes, involved in all of this, is that the man remembers that love does more, far more than pressure, than coercion. You can love people to do things much more than you can force them to do things. That's what we do. So yes, those are some of the things we do. And I did say, and because we've said it a few times, we need to listen to each other as husband and wife and if you are in a relationship and the guy is not listening to you, yellow flag is turning orange. It will soon be red. If he's not listening to you now, he's not going to listen to you after you get married. Same for the guy. If she's not listening to you now, she will not listen to you after marriage. So keep your eyes out, keep your ears open, and walk together. All right. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you, Uncle Richard. I think um, most of the questions left that I have, um, if one way or the Stop. other, I answered All right. it. So um, we, we, are, we are running far behind with time. But I want no to problem. ask anybody else who has a question. Like I said, um, Dr. Dr. Abe has, has, has really downloaded, the, has been recording the audio files. So if you need it, please don't hesitate to leave your email and I will try and get... Um, um, are you capable to try and get the, the audio files to you? So um, that that is it for for now. Um, I want to take the opportunity and probably hand over to um, the father of the house to to take over from here. Okay. Just before he comes on, I just want to let you all know that and to give thanks to God for Dr. Jacobs Abbey and his um, network, Prophet, through uh, Be Inspired podcast. We had. 34,991 people on this program. So we praise the Lord for it. All around the world, as you can see, different questions were coming in. So. Well, thank you very much, um, Uncle Krab, for this wonderful time. And I want to believe that it's really been a blessing. And if you've really been blessed, why don't we just clap our hands for Jesus as we also appreciate you know, Uncle Krab for this wonderful time. And I want to say thank you to Dr. Um, Samuel Jacob Abbey for this you know, opportunity to broadcast it to the nations. We appreciate you so very much. And I uh, could hear some you know, familiar faces. Um, Reverend Kisha, God bless you. Uh, <laughs> um, good to hear your voice. And uh, Mr. Nkansa, it was good to uh, see your face. And to all those of you calling from a uh, different part of the world, I want to say thank you very much. God bless you. It's been a wonderful time. 
And uh, please let us not just be a moment of information, but let's take it into our homes. Let's practicalize them. Let's leave them. Let's make them part of our family lives. I know that for some of us, it's going to be difficult you know, to transition from what we knew to what we've just been taught, okay? But we just have to start from somewhere, you know? It's going to be a struggle. It's not going to be easy, you know, for this transition to take place. You can't see yourself doing some of the things you've just been told to do, knowing what you've been taught growing up as a young man by reason of culture and family influence. And so... I mean, trying to apply some of these things is, is going to go against what you know. It's going to come with a lot of resistances from every angle. But we just have to understand that if we really want this to work for us in our various homes, then we have to start from somewhere. You know, we, we, it's not going to be easy. We're going to fail. We're going to you know, rise up again. But the point is that we don't have to give up. Let's keep working on them. and Let's keep working on ourselves. And let's get our families involved. Let's get our wives involved. Let them hear what we've heard. Let us allow them to help us transition. Because sometimes when you, as a man, want to do it, it's not going to be that easy if you don't get the help of your spouse. If you don't get the help of your wife, if you get the help of your girlfriend, I mean, it's going to be difficult. So let's allow them space. Let's allow them into what we are trying to do so that we can get the support from them because sometimes it can be very difficult knowing just who we are and what we've been taught. So it's not just an individual thing. Let's get our family involved, get your children involved to know that, hey, I've learned something new. I'm going to start doing some new things. So I would need you guys to help me do those things. Allow me space to do the things I've never done before. And let them help you. And that's the only way I believe we can transition. God will help us. The Spirit of God will help us. But we have to be resilient as well and put in the work. So thank you very much, everybody, for calling in. Thank you, uh, Mr. Crab. We thank God for your life. Thank God for the grace and the wisdom that God has given you. Thank God for this ministry that God has given you. I still know that there are nations and there are people who haven't still heard this and they need to hear it. And so we are praying for you that you, you yeah. go further than you are now so that people, I mean, I mean, like, like we said, marriage is, is, is the basic unit you know, of, of our society. But in many cases, like we said, you go to our institutions, you know, we are taught of all the you know, other fields, other subjects, but they don't take time to teach about marriage, you know, yet it is a basic unit. And so what you are doing, you are bringing healing, you are bringing restoration, you are bringing God's mind and God's blessing to the nations. And we applaud you for that. We are praying for you. And we ask that God will, I mean, sustain you and give you the opportunity even to, write, to reach out more to many people. So keep up with the good work. We thank God for you and Amen. your beloved wife, Mama Gideon. God bless you. Amen. Can we yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so having said this, um, and we are still celebrating Men's Week. Um, so um, Friday, there's quiz coming up on Friday. Uh, the time is, um, um, I think, 7 o'clock, right? 7 o'clock? 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock. 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock to 9.30. Okay. And then um, I'm going to allow him to do the announcement, but one of the things I'm excited about is Saturday. The Saturday, uh, the men are cooking, you know, the men are cooking. I'm very much excited about that. And so for all of you men, I mean, listening to us, I'm a thing that uh, you can take the time out to, to join this very wonderful thing. Uh, from the president, he just tested me and said, we are doing our cooking live on Zoom so that we can. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we are doing our cooking live on Zoom. Um, and it's starting from 4 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Okay, 4 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Um, Eastern time. And it's going to be live on Zoom. So every man just be in your apron, make sure that you have all your items, your ingredients, and all your recipes ready. And then we'll be on Zoom whilst we are cooking. I mean, and don't, I mean, you can call for help. You can call for backup, okay? So that if you need any help, I mean, but we want to see you on Zoom cooking. And so any man you want to join us, I mean, I think the, the ID, the code is, um, four, two, one, zero, zero. And so if you want to join us on Saturday, to be a great, we just want to have fun. We just also want to let our wives know that we are learning to cook so that um, they can be rest assured that uh, we can cook for them, take care of our children, and give them vacation with assurance that their home and their children is safe now. And so we want to practice that. I mean, I Minister mean, Sly is very excited about that. He's ready to cook, and uh, um, we're ready to test it. Glory to Jesus. Maybe it's good that we have fire service at, at some point. 
Uh, it, it's okay. It, it, whatever happens, God will help us. We will make sure that all the things we need are around. So everyone on this uh, platform, please try to get a circle from. Let's have a fun time. And when, the, when we are done, we'll have our wives and our the women around us, you know, come and taste it and tell us what they think. So that's going to be from 4 p.m. to 30 p.m. Eastern time. And um, Sunday, we'll have our men's celebration time. We we'll want to have fun. Whatever you are, say, man, you know, we just want to thank God for you. We want to celebrate you. Take time to celebrate your biological part. It's very important. You know, reach out to them. It doesn't matter what, what the upbringing has been, what the past has been. Love them. We have to forgive, forgive them, reach out to them, show kindness and so on. Not be that God will be a blessing to all of us. Amen. Um, so, um, but I could be, um, uh, uh, man, let me hand over to you and, ask, and then maybe you can take your offering from them. All right. Thank you very much, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Once more, thank you, Uncle Crab, for such an awesome time. Thank you that when we requested for your services, you never has stayed one minute. Um, Laura, thank you. Thank you again. Um, my takeaway from what you said was uh, for most of us men, we grew up from a polygamous family you know, way back in the early uh, late 70s and early 80s, uh, most of the ones we came up from, my dad had about 10, 15 kids. So what we knew as men, as the alpha male, the man who decides to be Victoria, but this doesn't work today. It's simply because we can't leave in our parents' world. And uh, providing all those amenities in the house, it's not good enough if we are not present or leading or serving. Okay. Um, we want to thank you, Uncle. We want to thank you for such an awesome message.